Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's roundtable, Disruption, Acceleration, and Innovation on the Frontline, presented by SureScripts. I'm Rebecca Williamson. I'm the publisher of Fierce Healthcare, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Uh, our speakers today are Tom Skelton, CEO of SureScripts, and Lynn Nowak, Evernorth Vice President and General Manager of Clinical Data and Provider Solutions. You can read their full bios by selecting the Speakers tab on the left side of your window. Um, I have just a few technical notes for you before we begin. Uh, the webinar is being streamed through your computer, so there's no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your volume is up. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand within 24 hours after the event. And time permitting, we'll be following the presentations with the Q&A session, so please submit your questions using that questions and answers tab on the left side of your screen. Um, so that's uh, all the technical notes that I have. I think we're ready to begin. Um, so to start us off, um, Tom and Lynn, can you tell me a little bit about yourselves and your work at SureScripts and Evernorth? And uh, Tom, I think we can start off with you. All right, thank you very much. Great to be here. Um, yeah, I've been uh, SureScripts now for about six years, uh, following uh, a longer portion of my career where I focused on provider and care delivery automation. So I've been in health IT for about 30 plus years and uh, really excited to be here today and frankly, really excited about the, the position we find ourselves in in the healthcare industry. I think we're at a great time in terms of innovation and really think we're in a position to make some great progress. Lynn, how about you? All right, uh, good morning or uh, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are in the country and uh, great to be with you here. Uh, again, Lynn Nowak, I lead our data strategies and our provider solutions for Evernorth. And I'm an internal medicine uh, physician by background. I've been, uh, I was in clinical practice for about 15 years prior to joining Express Scripts, uh, which has now uh, really transformed into our new health services company of Evernorth. And I, you know, just really excited to be here, have a long relationship with working with SureScripts uh, on our interoperability efforts, our electronic medical record uh, connectivity, and really all of our provider engagement strategies and, and how we're using data uh, and interoperability and connecti connectivity to, to really deliver information and, and work better with both our providers and, and with our customers. So just really excited to, to be here. Very good. All right, so I think we can begin. Um, so the role of care teams has been evolving for years, but COVID-19 presents new challenges for us. So Lynn, can you tell me how have clinicians changed the way they care for patients in the past year? Sure. Well, you know, uh, everything has changed in the last year, it seems, uh, just if nothing other than uh, the backgrounds behind Tom and I both here, you know, who would have thought uh, we'd be delivering this from, from our homes? And, uh, you know, the same is, is true in healthcare and on the provider side, whether it's physicians who are trying to navigate uh, safety protocols in their offices and, and doing more telehealth and virtual visits than, than ever, you know, certainly the acceleration of, of the tele, telemedicine, telehealth in general. And, you know, when you think about how pharmacies have had to adapt, you know, there was already, you know, a certain degree of, of care being delivered uh, at the pharmacy front, but you know that that has certainly accelerated with with folks coming, you know, not wanting to go into the hospitals or doctors' offices, or not being able to get into the hospitals and doctors' offices, and and seeking more of that care um, on the frontline pharmacies, and and then even in home care, right? So just thinking that the changes, whether it's via telemedicine or in home visits by nurses, and in some cases even pharmacists. To, to localize you know, into people's homes. So just really changing the landscape of that traditional, you know, going into the doctor's office to see your doctor to, to get your care, whether it's acute or preventative care, it's really turned the whole industry on its head, I would say, uh, over the course of the last year. So Tom, uh, moving over to you, talk to me a little bit about um, what technologies can be leveraged to help address some of these challenges, um, some of these changes and new challenges, um, particularly when it comes to accessing and sharing patient information. Sure, and I, I think, you know, starting with it, I would just highlight what Lynn said. I, you know, there, there's been a huge blurring of venues of care in the last year. And what that's meant is that the availability and accessibility of information is just you know a, a preeminent need. It just sits front and center because 
It's not really clear where the patient is going to be seen. And no matter where they show up, the information has to be there. So, you know, from our standpoint, this is the type of work that we've been doing for a long time. And the, the way that we look at it is just as the market is evolving in the way we deliver care, we need to evolve with it and make sure that we're in a position to continue to deliver value wherever that uh, clinician is, whether it's a physician, a pharmacist, a, a nurse, whomever, and they need the information we have. So, you know, from our standpoint, we started doing what we do about two decades ago. And, and a lot of that really focused in the world of e-prescribing. If you look at what's going on now, there are a lot of offerings in the market that you see that they matured one way and now they're evolving differently. And, and we see a lot more use of some of our emerging technologies than we saw in the days that were pre-COVID. And, uh, and you know, examples of that would be one we call clinical direct messaging, which is just an ability for a clinician to reach out and chat with another clinician and to have a discussion about a particular patient or exchange information there. That, that's one example. Another is there are some standards that were built a few years back that quite frankly hadn't been readily adopted. And, and now what we're seeing is that they are becoming adopted. And the idea here is always in a natural workflow, giving that clinician the ability to reach out to others that are on that patient's care team, get the information they need, deal with the administrative gates that exist out there, and ensure that we're all in a position where we're sharing the information that we need. And I, I think those are some key examples of the changes and evolution that we're seeing. And I think this gives a lot of us hope in terms of the way information sharing will evolve going forward. I think we're gonna take a quick break for an audience poll right now. Uh, so I'll read this out for you all. So how is, and we all want you to answer in the platform there. Uh, so how is COVID-19 impacting the need to access, exchange, and use electronic health information? Uh, so Tom and Lynn, while we wait for our audience to respond, what are your thoughts here? What have you been seeing? Lynn, you want me to go first or do you want this one? Uh, I'll let you go. This really, I think, carries what you were really just, just describing. So I'll let you you lead and I can uh, pile on. Yeah, I, I, our experience is that it is increasing. Our experience is that because of the nature of where care is being delivered, you know, whether it's virtual, whether it's in these emerging venues of care, there's just more demand for information um, from other portions of the healthcare system. And as a result, we see a lot of requests for you know, creative solutions and innovative solutions. We think that's a big positive. We think that that is um, absolutely the type of information sharing that we need the healthcare system to see. And we're excited about it. So we think the existing trends that were going on have all been reinforced by COVID. And we think there's some new things that are out there as well. But in the end, information sharing seems to be on the rise from our experience. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And and I think the the critical nature of the the availability of that information, as Tom mentioned before, regardless of where the patient presents for care. And and it's no longer the traditional, I'm always gonna go to my doctor's office, I'm always gonna have the chart there. You know, in the old days we used to go back to the back and pull the paper chart. And you know, now I you know was practicing when we actually had the paper charts. And that, you know, now it's, it's pulling it up in the EMR, but, you know, if a, if a patient goes to a different venue and those e the different EMRs don't connect to each other, that care provider is, is really entering into that patient's care delivery in the dark. And, yeah. and there are clearly quality and safety concerns about that. There is just a, a lack of information that may prohibit a decision being made, which can then end up delaying care. So the portability of that information and the connectivity of that information and, and interoperability of that information, regardless of where a patient is presenting for care or receiving care, is just so critical to, to the quality and safety of that, of that person's care. And that, that has just absolutely been accelerated. It was true before, we were all moving towards that before, there was a demand in the industry for that before, you know, really across across all of the different stakeholders. Patients were demanding it, providers were demanding it, payers are demanding it. 
but it, it now has become essential. It's no longer a convenience. It, it really is truly essential to delivery of care in, in this new environment. Yeah, and I would just further what Lynn said. I didn't mention the patient, but I, I think she's absolutely right. I, I think that's another example of, um, you know, the evolution and innovation that is taking place in the space. And just one other thing before we move to the next question, I, I think this the timing has just been so fascinating that this market demand has also correlated for better or worse and in many ways with a lot of regulatory requirements around interoperability and, and now moving forward into transparency. So I think the regulations were following market demand and now there's even more market demand that the regulations are are really kind of a catalyst for for what we really need to do, um, you know, in our care delivery system. But the you know the the increased access for patients to be able to 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 you know really own and be um, directing where their own data goes, all of that was really coming forward anyway through a lot of government regulations, and and so it's kind of coming to a head together, which is putting pressure on the system to deliver all of these interoperability requirements while also trying to manage. Uh, you know, COVID crisis and standing up vaccine registries and standing up testing and and all of the infrastructure that's needed to manage the pandemic. At the same time, our technology resources are trying to, you know, get everything uh, in place to comply with the regulations. So there's kind of a perfect storm uh, on pressure on the system, but it's also being, you know, really driven by a, a clear demand for these capabilities. And I think we can put uh, push out the results. Uh, they are not surprising. Looks like our audience overwhelmingly agrees. All right, so let's see, moving back to our discussion. Um, so it's clear the pandemic is driving big trend towards bringing care home um, and offering more virtual care and digital health services. Lynn, how can we enable patient care in that environment as well? Well, we've already clearly uh, touched on just, you know, the, the the data availability and portability and connectivity that's that's so critical. And and really, I think just the, the embracing of, uh, I'll call it telehealth uh, broadly, right? So, you know, Tom mentioned, we've been working to enable telehealth, telemedicine in, in variety of forms, even something as simple as, you know, delivering more care, offering more counseling uh, over the phone, we would consider that to be a, a form of telehealth. Uh, Express Scripts has been, you know, doing pharmacy counseling and pharmacy care uh, over the phone for, for decades. Uh, we're now very excited as Evernorth that we uh, just recently, just a few days ago, actually announced our intent uh, to acquire the MD Live telemedicine telehealth platform as just one, you know, way to kind of double down our efforts to, to enabling that care in the home. And, and I think the big thing that, that I would like to see, and I think as an industry, uh, we'd like to move forward is, is moving telehealth beyond just the acute care. So historically, and I think, you know, the, those who have been using telehealth for the most part, uh, in the past years has been, you know, runny noses, pink guy rashes, and, and really, you know, it's a convenience. It's been a, it's been a convenience platform. And really, I think the, the pandemic accelerating the use of telehealth for more maintenance care, more uh, connectivity with your primary care physician and not a disrupted or, uh, you know, fragmented care, which has often been the case and for pink eye and strep throat, maybe that's not the end of the world, but uh, you know, it's not ideal having that fragmentation, uh, which has kind of, I think, marked some of the telehealth in, in the past. I think we're moving past that, which is great. So really using the the telehealth, again, whether it's a video call or a phone call or you know a virtual visit of some kind, really embracing that as a new way to deliver care for chronic conditions, for uh, routine care where it's appropriate. Again, I, I'm an internal medicine physician, and there there are times when nothing replaces that face-to-face, -face, you know, hands-on delivery of care where you need to examine a patient and listen to you know their their heart and 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 those critical things. Not not to suggest that we could ever fully replace uh, an in-person encounter with a provider where that's appropriate, but 
for for so many episodes of care that that really you know in person visit isn't necessary takes more time inconvenient for the patients time away from work sitting in a waiting room all of those things that you know are, are not the great part of going to the doctor's office uh, telemedicine and, and telehealth I think can really really advance um, the experience and and certainly you know in many cases uh, maybe improve the outcomes we get, hopefully improve the outcomes we get. And I think we've certainly proven that we're not compromising the safety and quality and outcomes when it's used appropriately. So I'm excited to see where that takes us at Evernorth. We're excited to, you know, to really embrace the capabilities we're going to have through a, a new telehealth platform and, you know, just so many, so many opportunities to really drive that to the next level. I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. Um, Tom, can you talk to me, how has the conversation around price transparency changed because of COVID-19? No, I think that's a great question. And I, it, it goes back to some of the things that Lynn was saying, and I, I love that expression, that perfect storm expression. You know, there, there's a lot of things that have gone into this with, with COVID hitting, with the, um, the, the drive towards consumers being much more engaged and savvy about how we go after getting our healthcare needs met. And, and you put all of these things together and, and all of a sudden, you know, you, you've got a, a very interesting situation. And I think that's what's happened here with real time. If you look at price transparency, and where we focus is on the medication side, obviously. This is something that's been building for some time. The standards were out there, the technology existed, but frankly, it wasn't getting used real heavily and it wasn't clear what the uptake would be. But over the course of the last couple of years, it was starting to build momentum. And, and I think COVID just you know accelerated that much further. If for no other reason than we've gone you know from a situation where we had three and a half percent unemployment to a, a situation where we've got over six percent unemployment, so we've doubled the number of unemployed. And that doesn't even count the poor people that are out there because of this and have just given up looking for a job. And when those people need health care, getting the access is one key, and that's that's part of what Lynn pointed out is you know the the whole telemedicine and platform, the change in the venues of care, that's an important aspect of it. And then when they're sitting in there, they, they now are told they need a medication and they may hear a number that they don't like. And when they hear a number that they don't like, the data tells us they won't get that medication, right? It, it, we Our data shows that if the number is above $50, one in four prescribed medications is not filled. And if that number goes to $500 for a very high-end specialty drug, then 60% of the time, the patient doesn't get that treatment regimen dealt with. And, and that's obviously a problem that backs up in the system. And then we end up with other costs there as that patient is at that point in time, just not going to get the care that they really need and deserve. And so price transparency is important because it encourages a dialogue at the point of prescribing or at the point of dispensing about what the alternatives are and what those costs may be. And it does it with trusted experts, right? You're doing it with your physician, you're doing it with your pharmacist, and you're having a good engaging dialogue. That's very different than leaving and then finding out that you've got a pricing problem and then trying to call back in and trying to get help from one of the offices, et cetera. So, you know, we, we absolutely see greater demand for price transparency type solutions. We're seeing greater demand for exposure to clinical alternatives. And we think that this is something that will just continue and grow. Um, you know, we have um, been successful right now in helping to increase this offering to the point where over 400,000 prescribers across the country are getting this from us. And we see continued growth in 2021. Yeah, and I think this yeah. has just been such a great example of the partnership that we've had between Express Scripts and Sure Scripts that I know, uh, you know, Tom and I are both very proud of. It has really been driving to those high adoption numbers. And, you know, what I think has been great about the, the push is, is putting this information in the hands of the prescribers. And we've had, you know, we've had tools, at least at Express Scripts, we've had tools for consumers to do price checking for over a decade. So the, the, the transparency has been out there at the consumer level, but the reality is it just really hasn't been used all that much uh, historically. I agree with Tom that with increasing economic pressures and just awareness and, and consumer 
uh, you know, consumers taking more accountability and responsibility and, and more engagement in their own care. We have absolutely seen an uptick of those uh, of those consumer facing tools that we've had in place and continue to develop and make them easier to use and, and more valuable to use. But putting that information through real time prescription benefit check into the EMR, into the doctor's workflow at or the prescriber at the point of care when that decision is being made is just so incredibly valuable. And, it, and as Tom said, it, it triggers that dialogue and enables that discussion. It enables you know, options and, and an engagement between the doctor and, and the patient that if they're not gonna be able to afford the maybe what was the first choice, there's a good chance that maybe a less expensive alternative is gonna be okay. And let's have that conversation up front and make that switch right there at, you know, at, at the onset so you don't get that downstream back and forth and all that administrative disruption and delay in the care. And unfortunately, too often, the abandonment of that therapy and then the patient's not getting the care. So I think really encouraging that dialogue between the provider and the patient at the point of care. And if it doesn't happen there, which unfortunately it doesn't always, being able to have that, that kind of second layer of protection at the point of dispensing when the pharmacist can potentially have that conversation with, with the patient as well. So just really trying to wrap our arms around the, the patient and make sure that they get the care they need at an affordable, um, hopefully the most affordable price and, and also you know in line with the patient's benefits. So you know that really becomes a win-win for, for the payers as well. So it, it really has just been a great success story and, and the adoption just continues to grow because of that. So this is a good segue to our second poll question. Um, so, and again, you can uh, uh, um, respond directly in the console here. So with rising unemployment and more cost conscious patients, have you or your providers seen a need for greater price transparency? Um, I know you all kind of commented on this a little bit, but do you have any other comments that you want to make while we're waiting for our audience to respond? You know, the other thing that I would highlight is uh, some of the downstream benefits, you know, in conversations with a pharmacist currently or previously, if they had to engage in a discussion with one of us and do some price shopping for the prescription, that could be pretty challenging. And that would take them in, the, in their view, 15 or 20 minutes to do. And with the new tools that are available, they get re that get, gets reduced pretty quickly. And they're telling us now it's taking about five minutes. And while that doesn't sound massive, that savings is very important in the day of busy clinicians, right? I mean, listen, we've got the best clinical people in the world. The key is letting them practice medicine. And this information puts them in a position where they can focus more on the patient that's in front of them rather than trying to grab bits and pieces of information so that they can have the discussion that they want to have. Yeah, I, I, think, I think he said it perfectly. All right, great. Well, let's see what our audience thinks. And there we go, yeah. as expected. All right, so we can uh, move back to our discussion now. So Lynn, um, what technology is available to bring more visibility to things like prescription costs and help empower consumers to be more informed decision makers? Well, I think we've, you know, we've touched on on the real time prescription benefits, which uh, just I guess we're Tom and I have both been speaking as if everyone on the call uh, knows what that means. So I'll, I'll maybe give a little bit of a description there. Uh, so really what what SureScripts has enabled and Express Scripts and, and other payers have, have certainly taken advantage of is the ability for us to actually display at the point of prescribing the consumer specific, that patient specific price of a medication at that point in time. So for that patient on that day at the specific pharmacy that's chosen, what is that patient's out of pocket cost going to be? And then beyond that, at the same time, sharing the differential of cost potentially to that patient for a 30 day supply at that pharmacy, a 90 day supply at that pharmacy, or if they have a home delivery option or another pharmacy option that could be shown as well. And then for also presenting other clinical alternatives. So if that particular drug has, if there's a competitor drug or maybe a generic drug at, at a lower cost point, 
uh, we can show alternatives to the provider at that time. And even in addition to that, if there are any other things like a prior authorization required, or maybe there's a quantity level limit. So other um, different benefit specific uh, information that may tie into the prescribing decision, all of that can be visible to the provider at the point of prescribing right there in the moment. So if you think about, you know, what I always refer to as the old process of go fish, where the, the prescriber orders a drug, the PBM reacts to that and maybe they decline it or, you know, they, they have restrictions on it. That often happens after the patient has left. The patient often gets that surprise at the pharmacy when they had no idea what that drug was gonna cost until they, they show up. And, and this really eliminates that surprise factor. It eliminates the, you know, finding out after the patient's left that the drug's not covered, maybe it's not on formulary, or, you know, the patient may find out six months later, you know, from another mom at the soccer field that, you know, they're on, you know, they have the same condition and they're on a drug that's, you know, half the cost and, and nobody ever presented that alternative to them. So it really, you know, those tools at the point of prescribing with all that visibility to so much information to, to guide the best choice is just so critically important. And then, you know, and I think most payers now have some sort of a consumer facing price shopping, price comparison, drug, you know, price checking tool available. And, and I think just you're seeing more and more utilization of those tools, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, there are other tools in the market that are, um, are available that are not as patient specific. And so, you know, what we're really proud about with, you know, our tools that we provide from Express Scripts and make available to, uh, to our clients on behalf of their customers. And, you know, that, that SureScripts has as well through the real-time prescription benefits, I think it's so critical the accuracy of those tools where they're tied into the patient specific benefit. So some of the other, I'll call them more publicly available drug pricing tools um, that aren't connected into the patient specific benefit can be a little misleading and, and, and not really accurately reflect what's, what's unique to that individual patient. So I'll pose this next question to both of you. Um, Lynn, I think we can start with you. How can we reduce the administrative burden on providers so they can be more proactive and effective members of a patient's care team, particularly during the pandemic? You just described my job. <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's exactly uh, really why, why I have a job and why, uh, what my team is focused on every day. So thanks for that question. You know, we've already touched a lot on on the price transparency, you know, really helping reduce that downstream burden on making switches and trying to find cheaper alternatives when a patient can't afford their medication. You know, what we haven't talked about yet, uh, which is if you ask any provider uh, what's probably their biggest burden in their in their office today, nine out of 10, if not 10 out of 10, we'll say prior authorization. So anything we can do to reduce the burden on prior authorization is, is a win across the board. And, you know, we understand the value and the importance of prior authorization. Many people question, why do we even do it? You know, from, from a safety and, and, a, and a patient protection uh, perspective, you know, really important uh, aspect of the prior authorization that I think often isn't fully appreciated but also just the affordability front, right? Trying to really make sure we get, get those patients on the right drug at the right time and most aligned with their benefit and most cost effective for them as well. That's why prior auth is there. It is not there to make you know physician offices crazy and, and delay care, which is what it's often accused of. So anything we can do to accomplish that goal of patient safety and, and cost effectiveness, but also reducing the burden of the documentation and the back and forth and the delays and getting a response. And that's really where we've spent, you know, again, working very closely with SureScripts and, and on our own internal processes around automation and having that data connectivity and data availability to streamline and, you know, do a lot of work to auto answer criteria questions with data that we already have. And, in many cases, be able to auto decide, really, you know, automatically make it, you know, render a decision on a prior author approval 
without disruption to the physician, without requiring additional documentation. And all of that is only possible when we're optimizing the electronic prior authorization process. So really having that transaction occur, occur digitally enables so much automation and so much efficiency, better for the doctor's office, better for us to get a turnaround time, better to get that care on, on the appropriate therapy um, for the patient and, and substantially reducing the burden on our doctor's offices. So that, that's probably the, the biggest area where I think we've made a lot of progress um, in reducing burden, not to say we've solved solved it all. There's there's a lot of room to improve and a lot more work we we're excited to continue doing, but um, huge, huge strides made in, in the prior authorization front. And and Tom mentioned the clinical direct messaging as well. I think that's been a real uh, a real improvement in helping doctors communicate with each other and with payers in many cases as well. And Tom, I'm sure you have some things you'd like to add. Sure, happy to uh, to try and follow that. But uh, yeah, I think Lynn touched on on all the key pieces. But the 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 real important piece is we've got a lot of information in the system, right? And so many of these administrative burdens that flow to the physician could, quite frankly, be completely digitized via a better process. And so we we've got to go after that. Then to do that, we've got to make sure that the information that exists about that patient that is relevant to this care event is made available not just to the the provider but also to their support teams because part of the way you win this battle i think is making sure that many of these items don't even make it to the provider that we take the opportunity to grab that information from other healthcare venues or from other places that the patient has visited, and then we make it available prior to the visit. We make it available as an outcome of this visit where there are actions to be taken. We then start to blend these things. And I think we're seeing a lot of this work. Lynn mentioned prior authorization. I think there's also another lens that you could share here, and that is if you just look at specialty medications and you, you take advantage of you know, this wonderful science that has been put out there to help some of the people in the U.S. that really need some help. These are high-end medications. Getting to them is not easy. There are gates that have to be cleared. And systemically, we can deal with a lot of those gates. And that's part of what we're all investing in here is sharing information more broadly and not just giving the information to anyone at any point, but really packaging it and distributing it in a way that allows these gates to be cleared without physician interaction, without the patient having to make five follow-up phone calls. So it, it is also a combination of the convenience of the care, which is important, but also quite frankly, that time to treatment as Lynn talked about, that number can just drag on too long. And we think there's a great opportunity to take care of that. You know, it's, it's interesting if you talk to pharmacists, and I don't have this number for physicians handy, but if you talk to pharmacists, they would tell you that when they're dealing with a specialty medication, that by and large, they feel more like an administrator than they do a clinician. And that's an opportunity for all of us in the healthcare system. We can work on that and help them so that they're doing more clinical work and less administrative work. And I can give a great example uh, of how we've actually put that into practice. That's a, that's a great point that Tom raises about the specialty pharmacy that, you know, at our Accredo specialty pharmacy, we've, we've partnered with SureScripts over the last few years to, to take advantage of the record locator and exchange capability to have, so when we have a new start patient, so we've got a new patient coming in and they're starting on a, a new complex medication, we have our clinical protocols uh, that we have in place to, to make sure we're doing that safely with that patient. And that usually involves a gathering of information from their, from their medical history. And you know, these, again, these are often injectable medications. These are, these are complex condition these patients have. They're, they're complicated medication regimens. And frankly, they're very expensive medication regimens in most cases. So we wanna make sure they're on the right medication and they're getting it appropriately and that we have all of the information we need to safely care for that patient as their specialty pharmacy. And historically, the way we would do that is reaching out to the provider, either phone call or fax, 
waiting for the provider's office to pull the record, send the records over to us, get that documentation into our system before we could uh, proceed with uh, initiating that therapy. And that took time and that that could put, you know, an unnecessary delay or a necessary, but, you know, an unfortunate, you know, time lapse and when we could start therapy to make sure we did it safely. And what we found over the last few years using the record locator and exchange, we're able to electronically now reach out into the system and identify where has that patient received care, query the, query the network for those records and pull in much of that clinical data through the network straight into our system to, to be able to start care almost immediately because we can get our hands on that clinical information without having to burden the doctor, without having to have those delays in, uh, you know, getting the information we need from the office. And, and it's just, again, it's a win-win across the board. It's, it's better for us, better for the patient, better for the doctors, and less administrative burden on everyone. And most importantly, the patient gets the care they need quickly. So it's, it's been a great, a great success in that regard. We've got uh, one more question uh, to close us out before we move over to Q&A. Um, and again, I'll leave this to the two of you to answer. Uh, what sorts of innovation do you expect to see coming out of this year? And then Tom, do you wanna maybe kick us off? Sure. Um, well, I think Lynn started us off early in the session with uh, uh, some key points about access, convenience of care, um, you know, changing care venues. And I, I think that area, will continue to be quite active, you know, whether it's transportation or how the medications are delivered or the nature of virtual care. I, I think all of that, everything around convenience and access is going to be important. I think this issue of clinical workflow optimization, and, and I, I tie that into information sharing, I, I think they kind of go hand in hand. I think that's going to continue to be a very hot area. I think there's a, a lot of pressure in the system. We see a lot of burnout with clinicians. We see a lot of challenges in retaining um, clinicians. And so when you look at that, I, I think we've um, done a great job over the years of implementing the electronic health record. I, I think now that there'll be another wave of changes that is really very physician friendly, very pharmacist friendly to help streamline those workflows. And then lastly, I, I think we're going to see a lot of activity in the area of public health. Um, I think there's been, for the last uh, number of years, a lot of discussion about consumer-led medicine. And I think it has a big role to play, but I also think we've learned some things under COVID that truthfully, at certain times, we don't have all the information in the places that we need to have it in order for us to act in a holistic way to protect the populace and do the things that we need to do. So I would expect to see innovation and in technology around public-private partnerships to help solve for these problems and make sure that we're in a better position should something like this ever happen again. Yeah, I completely agree with everything Tom said. And I guess, you know, one thing I would add to that uh, is is not just the, you know, we've been focusing a lot on the connectivity and the interoperability and availability of data. And I think the next wave of innovation is going to be how do we use that data? And, and really, now that we've got access to it or will have access to it if we don't today, how do we really optimize the analytics, the machine learning, predictive modeling to really anticipate uh, patients' needs, uh, you know, pre pre approve a prior authorization that hasn't even come to us yet because we know that you know we, we anticipate it's probably going to happen so getting as far upstream in in many of these processes improving the workflows with with either automation or machine learning where that makes sense um, and really optimizing what the data can do for us uh, now that there's there's more free flow of that information Very good. All right, well, I think it's time for us to move on to Q&A. Um, and as a reminder, if you haven't submitted your questions, there's still time uh, to do that in the Q&A tab on your console. Uh, so let's see, this first question, um, Tom, I think this is a good one for you. How can we better address some of the information sharing challenges that we'll face around vaccines? Yeah, I'm not sure if this is a good one for me or if it's a good one for anyone. Um, I, I think. I think this is one of the areas that we've had a huge amount of challenges as a healthcare system. 
and I think it highlights some of the issues that I mentioned around the need for tighter public-private partnerships. If we look at what's going on there, the original challenge was understanding who had the, uh, the virus and where were they being seen. And I think that industry and um, the, the federal government through the CDC and through some of the state and uh, local agencies did a good job of repurposing tools to get that information gathered so that we had a good sense of what was going on. I, I think the next step though is in the distribution of, of the vaccine and who has been vaccinated and who needs the second vaccine, et cetera. I, I think that's a very challenging situation right now because the, the model for distribution is so federated, but I am confident that taking existing tools and repurposing them is going to be a big part of this answer. The, the ability to capture at the point of the vaccination who the patient was and what type of vaccine they were given is something that the health systems are very well prepared to do. And I, I think that's a big positive. I think the health plans have some infrastructure here. I think we need to make sure that the areas that are dealt with are the ones that are doing mass vaccinations where you know you invite people to a, a football stadium and you you do ten thousand in a morning, I think at that point in time the information infrastructure is going to need a lot of attention, and, and we're under a time crunch, right? I mean the, the truth is if we don't get this under control here in a matter of weeks, it's going to be difficult to catch the big wave that is coming. Although I will go further and say I think we're going to be in this mode for a, a long period of time, probably longer than any of us would hope. But I think that it will take a bunch of partnerships, as I've described, to get us there. Thank you. All right, next question. Um, I recently read in the news that Evernorth is acquiring telehealth company MD, MD Live. Uh, Lynn, do you want to? I think this is a good one for you. Yeah. Is there is there a question attached to that, or just <laughs> wanting more information? Uh, I guess. Can you tell <laughs> us more about that? Okay. Uh, I think I touched on that a little bit. Uh, you know, if, if you think about everything that we've just been discussing for the last, you know, half an hour, 40 minutes or so, just with this movement towards the non-traditional delivery of care and, and really looking at al alternative ways to give, give patients what I'll call different front doors into their care, whether it's over the phone or via uh, a video chat. And, and I think, you know, the the opportunity to go beyond those acute visits and, and really start to make the telemedicine visit, the virtual visit, those connections with either physicians or pharmacists or nurses, social workers, other uh, coaches and care managers, you know, being able to do that virtually without requiring a person to come into a brick and mortar place uh, is I think where all of us really see healthcare going and, and that, that kind of bringing it back into, into the home or, or really into the patient's control, which may or may not be their home, right? Could be their office. Um, and although their office now seems to be the home in many cases, so it all kind of tends to blur as Tom said. And, and that's really, uh, I think the direction we see care going, which was why we were so excited about uh, the acquisition. We've been working with MD Live for, for many years um, as well as other telehealth vendors. So one thing uh, I, I want to be really clear as well, um, Evernorth is is a health services company that is will be, you know is and will be grounded in partnerships. So just because we are uh, acquiring MD Live does not mean we will not be working with other telemedicine vendors and other other partnerships. So it really um, is an open architecture framework that that we're very proud of and. You know, we just wanted to take our relationship with MD Live a next level so we could own that asset and build upon it. But we have every intention of working with with other uh, other partners and vendors as well. And just to enable that platform for, for new ways and new alternative ways of delivering care is really, I think, what it comes down to. It's not something special, you know, uniquely about a a, a virtual visit in and of itself. It's the platform and the opportunities that that's going to open up for us that, that we're really excited about connecting all the different aspects of a patient's care in, in a platform that can bring that all together. 
So how do you prevent doctors from automatically picking the least expensive drugs versus the one they feel will be best if you encourage them to consider price? Here, Lynn or Tom, do you want, you want to take that one? Lynn, being the doctor, <laughs> would you like to start first? Sure. So uh, having uh, having been there, done that on, on both sides of, of this equation, uh, you know, it, previously and, and being the one choosing and now being in the one, you know, helping my colleagues make the best choice. I think ultimately clinical always has to come first, right? So I, I think any of us who are even working in benefit management, and yes, there is a cost component and a benefit component, how we approach our formulary and our, our, our P&T committees uh, at Express Scripts, it's always clinical first. So we would never ask or expect a, a clinician to compromise clinical care or quality. Um, but cost can and should, we believe, come into the equation as long as you're not compromising clinical you know, quality or safety. And so historically, the, the pricing component, the benefit component was, was a black hole to the, to the decision makers. And, and they really had not minimal, if any, visibility. Maybe they knew formulary versus non-formulary or brand versus generic. And, and that was helpful, but you know, the different cost discrepancies can be substantial. And you know, in many classes of drugs where there are multiple choices, there, there really is, is not a substantial, if any, difference from, from one brand to another brand or you know, between the brand or the generic. And, and the providers that were making the, the decision had no visibility to that. So we would always want clinical to come first, but where there is, is, is a neutral uh, clinical efficacy, we would always want, you know, for both the, the patient's consideration, the payer's consideration, and, and increasingly when doctors are being held accountable through value-based care and, and pay for performance arrangements, the doctors, you know, are being held accountable for making, you know, economically wise decisions as well. But you know, we, we would never want or expect a physician to compromise the, the clinical the clinical part of the care. Here's another question. I think this one could be a good one for you, Tom. Uh, so doctors can be ignor ignorant of medication costs and coverage based on patients' plans, and only consumer tools and services will empower consumers to take charge. What has been your pro what has been your progress and priority in cre creating such services? All right, that's a mouthful. Yeah. No, that, that's a great question, and I, I like the way that's worded. That that's exactly what real time prescription benefit is all about. That there is a, a recognition that in order to have that cost discussion that Lynn just talked about, once the the physician has made their clinical choice, other information then becomes available that is then plan driven, and so it is the cost of the medication for this patient given their copay status within their plan and given the, the different levels of formulary and the, the different um, recommended medications based on what either they um, selected in their plan or their employer did when they selected on their behalf, you know, we're trying to put that information front and center so that what the prescriber is actually seeing there is, okay, well, my choice clinically is A, a comes with it for this patient at this cost. Now, here's some other alternatives. If that cost isn't necessarily a cost that the patient is comfortable with, here's some alternatives and what those costs can look like. So now we can have a discussion about what is the best approach for this particular patient. You know, I, I can give you an example of this where, you know, my, my mother had a, a condition with her eyes. She shows up and she gets a $500 copay, right? That, and she's one of those people, she's not, you know, to her $500 was a mortgage payment. She's not spending $500 on a medication. And so she says to her physician, you know, what, what are my choices? What are my alternatives here? And fortunately, she had this tool and was able to go in and find out what those were. And it, it's still not cheap, but it was $100 versus $500. And while my mother wasn't thrilled at the $100, she did go get it. And, you know, she now utilizes that medication. That's exactly the type of behavior that we're looking to engender, that dialogue and a better outcome for the patient. 
Yeah, and I'll just add one quick thing, um, which Tom mentioned earlier, but I think it, it warrants repeating. A drug that a patient can't afford won't be taken. And so if, you know, if there is an alternative that may not be clinically the first, like absolute most optimal choice, but there is a second choice that maybe isn't exactly what the doctor would have preferred, but the patient can afford it and they will take it and they will get a, a good outcome. That's better than a first choice drug that the patient's not going to take. So again, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to misrepresent that we would ever want quality to be compromised, but a, a patient who's not taking the medication they need at all is not going to get the outcome we want. So it becomes a part of the decision-making process for the overall uh, best outcome for the patient. And, and, and that is what we're really looking for. And, and it becomes, you know, different data points in the decision-making, not a single data point. That's a really good point. So I think we have time for one more question. And this one, I think I can have both of you comment on it. Um, the healthcare industry will have winners and losers with greater consumer control, knowledge, and options. Disruption is treated as code for incumbents will suffer. Is that true? <laughs> well, I, I can take that. that. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll look at it and, you know, I'll, I'll take one crack and then Lynn can try and course correct where I get it wrong. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think the, the point here is that there's a ton of innovation going on around the space, right? If you look at it last year in the health IT space, there was over $10 billion of private equity funding that flowed into the space. So the amount of innovation, the, the breadth of the innovation, the pace of the innovation it is unbelievable. And so the, the point here is that if we're not all evolving quickly and staying at pace or ahead of the market, then yes, frankly, we, we are all at risk. So we do have to run and change and evolve and react to the changes that the patients want us to react to and need us to react to. So I, I think there's a, a lot of interesting things and a lot of interesting directions we could take that question, but I do think it comes back to the core of lots of innovation going on, particularly in care delivery and, and everything Lynn has already talked about there, the world of information sharing and some of the areas around public and private partnerships. Yeah, I, disruption is going to be the norm, I think, as we go forward. And I, I actually sit on the innovation team within Evernorth. So this is really what we are charged to do is, is really think disruptively internally. And, and really kind of recognizing if we don't disrupt ourselves, somebody else will. So we know that there are always, you know, again, with, with this increasing flow of information and accessibility of data, is that a threat to our traditional business model? Sure it is, but we've seen that coming. We've been planning for that. And, and it also creates tremendous opportunity for us as well. So, you know, are we gonna be able to do things the way we do them today for the next 20 years? Absolutely not. Are we going to be able to do them for the next two years? Maybe not. I mean, disruption is also happening at a faster cycle than we have ever seen before, where, you know, historically, you know, I think the, the trend was, I think it was a seven year cycle of, you know, what, you know, typical innovation would take about a seven year cycle. We're seeing that in maybe 18 months now. You can, you know, you, you can pop up a, a, a new website overnight and, Digital apps, you know, there, there's really no, there's no barrier to entrepreneurship now that that creates a tremendous amount of opportunity. Um, but there is a threat. Uh, sure. So we it, it's our it's our job to, to look internally at how do we disrupt ourselves? How do we think about what others are looking to do to disrupt the industry? And and I would say all of that is driven by what problems are they trying to solve and and where is the need? Where are the gaps? Where can something be done better, cheaper, faster? And, and those are all the questions that we ask ourselves to, to stay competitive and, and to bring new solutions uh, to the market that'll keep us relevant and keep us growing and keep us evolving for the better. So I think the competition is, is good. It's a good thing. It pushes all of us to do better. And uh, I, I think it's ultimately gonna be great for doctors and patients 
that there's there's this drive to do things better and solve the problems that are, are challenging everybody today. So we embrace it. Very good. So I think that's all the questions that we have time for. Um, as a reminder, if we didn't get to your question, um, we'll try our best to get back to everyone um, after the webinar. So I wanna thank you all for attending this Spears Healthcare webinar. And again, we wanna thank you for submitting so many great questions. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers for participating and SureScripts for presenting today's webinar. Uh, this has been recorded. You'll be able to access the recording within 24 hours using that same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Again, thanks for joining us and uh, we hope to see you at future events.